Welcome everyone to the Kid Lit Social. I'm Laura Backus, publisher of Children's Book Insider, the Children's Writing Monthly, and co-creator with my husband of writingblueprints.com. And of course, writeforkids.org, as you see on your screen there, that's sort of our main hub site with our blog and links to everything we do. So welcome for those of you who are with us for the first time, welcome. And if you are with us for the first time and you want to get on our list so that you know everything we do, including who's going to be on the Kidlet Social uh, in the coming weeks, go to writeforkids.org forward slash ultimate dash cheat sheet. And you will not only get on our list, but you will get a gift from us. It's an ebook that compiles our best beginner tips from 31 years of being in this business. And that's how long we've been around, long time. And if you are interested in subscribing to Children's Book Insider, which is our newsletter that started 31 years ago, last May, so we're over 31 years, uh, you could go to writeforkids.org forward slash CBI. We have a special offer, five bucks a month for our socialites. You will get the newsletter every month delivered to your inbox. It's about 20 pages. Uh, it will have lots of great stuff in it, including one special above the slush pile code for either an editor or an agent that we do an interview with that you can use to submit to them for the month and jump over the slush pile, get read faster, which is awesome. Plus we have other marketing information, how-to articles, interviews with authors, uh, all kinds of great stuff in there. And access to our membership site, the CBI Clubhouse, which comes with your uh, newsletter subscription, where you have access to a uh, backlog of 31 years worth of information. So, such a deal. So, hope to see you there. So, now we get to celebrate. Yay! Uh, this, for those of you who are new, this is something that uh, we do every week. Uh, our, our listeners, our members, they send me their good news and we celebrate. So we've got some good ones. And actually what's been so great is I have so many celebrates right now. I couldn't run them all this week. I have to save some for next week, which is the best kind of celebrate. So here's this week's and I just do them in the order they come in. I try, I don't play favorites, I swear. <laughs> So Julie Reed, who's a longtime subscriber to our newsletter, announced the July 2021 publication of her first picture book, Stella's Umbrellas from Adelaide Books. And her second picture book, If I Met the Moon at Night, will be released by Adelaide in 2022. So Julie, congratulations on that. I love the cover of this book. I just think it's so charming. So congrats, and I hope that does well for you. Uh, Christine Van Zant wrote, I just wanted to share the good news that your August 2021 above the slush pile code worked. Woo! I'm now represented by Liza Flessig at the Liza Royce Agency. So Christine's book is called A Brief History of Underpants, and we expect to hear from you as soon as you get a publishing contract on that, Christine. Congratulations. That is awesome. And, you know, I have, uh, if you go to our website, writeforkids.org, across the top, there's a little tab that says uh, Kidlit Social Replays, and you can listen to the replays of all the socials we've done. These two women have been on the social because we have great people from the industry, and yet they still send us celebrations because every milestone is worth celebrating, and I love that. So Gloria Adams, Illustrated Middle Grade Biography, James A. Bailey, the genius behind the Barnum and Bailey Circus, was released this past July from Slanted Inc. And Gloria is part of the Two for One Kid Critiques team that we had on Distancing Social Number 46, where they talked about how to make sure your manuscript is submission ready. So if you want to know about that, go check out that recording. And our friend Violet LeMay wrote, using your middle grade young adult blueprint, I finished writing the first draft of my novel. Wow, I can't believe it. Yay, Violet. So Violet is a very talented illustrator and she does uh, 
picture books, and she also writes and illustrates uh, board books and, and illustrates picture books. But she is now writing a middle grade novel. So congrats on that, Violet. And um, thank you for using our middle grade young adult blueprint to help you do that. And I expect to hear from you when that goes on submission and gets a publishing contract. And her distancing social was number 53 if you are an author illustrator and want to hear from her. She had a lot of great things to say. So I want to hear your good news. Email me at mail at writeforkids.org and put celebrate in the subject line and we will feature your news on a future Kidlit social and no celebration is too small. We want to help you acknowledge your progress every step of the way it's all good and i have something to celebrate thursday this thursday uh we are hosting a webinar that's going to be amazing it's called finish big mastering the five kidlit story endings and it's with jess trudell who is an educator and writer and the author of spoiler alert satisfying story endings and how to craft them. She has analyzed kid lit past and present and fiction. We're talking fiction here and realized that it all most the vast, vast, vast majority fall within one of five endings and figuring out kind of what kind of ending you want for your story will help you determine how to get there. And she's also going to talk about how to reverse brainstorm. So if you know the ending you want, but you want to figure out the best way to get to that ending, you can work backwards. It's going to be really, really cool. And if you sign up for the live event, which is this Thursday, it's 47 bucks. You save $20. It's an hour and a half webinar. You get a PDF takeaway with a lot of great info on it. If you can't attend live, you will get full access to the replay and the PDF the next day. After the live event, it will be sold through our writingblueprints.com site, and then it will be $67. So I hope to see you all there. Again, any kind of fiction picture book through young adult, this is amazing. And I've seen her slides in her outline, and I am blown away. And that doesn't happen very often after 31 years, just saying. <laughs> okay, links of interest. I got two good ones here. So Alice Kuypers, who is a wonderful author and a really, really uh, busy person <laughs> has this great uh, video actually and uh, other uh, information on her author newsletter called How You Can Find the Time to Write and Read Everything. Um, and it gives great tips for creating rhythms for writing and family and work and life in your work. Now, Alice is one of our Writing Blueprint instructors, but she's also uh, has written, I think, 15 novels and she she runs a nonprofit and she's just super busy and she has four kids and she has two other uh, young people living in her house right now who she's helping out. And it's just like, oh my gosh, and she gets it all done. So I thought you might want to hear from her. So you can go to a direct link, bit.ly forward slash manage writing time. And she's just awesome. And then uh, this is a great article, Why Write This Book by Jenny Nash on Jane Friedman's blog, says the first, oh, I, I did not write that very well. It should be the first question writers must, the first step writers must take, sorry, I left out a word, is answering why must you tell this story? Why must you tell this story? Before you do anything else, you have to answer that question for yourself. And I love that. I totally agree with it. In fact, that might be something I will ask my guest tonight. Um, and this this talks about that and gives you uh, kind of guidelines for how to do that and how that will find your way into your book. So bit.ly forward slash why write this book. Now I get to have my guest come on with me. Nadia Solomon's career as a journalist and television reporter has taken her from Alaska to South Carolina, Mississippi, and Massachusetts. 
After leaving news, she spent a couple of years writing songs and performing around Boston's music scene and released an extended album called Shattered Skies. I don't think we've ever had a singer on The Social. I'm impressed. Before turning her attention to writing for children. Her debut picture book, Goodnight Ganesha, was released on August 31st from Philomel Books, and she has several more picture books and a graphic novel manuscripts in progress and focuses on books that feature South Asian and Caribbean cultures, STEM concepts, and nonfiction subjects, and are filled with humor. And as you will soon learn, Nadia is one very busy lady. And tonight she's going to give us some insight into the steps she took both before her manuscript got published uh, in order to make it uh, something that an agent and editor wanted, and then all the work she's done since her publishing contract to get the word out about her book. And that is something that uh, a lot of people ask about. What should I do to market my book? I think Nadia is going to have a lot of really great information for us here. So Nadia, welcome. There you are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Laura. Thank you for having me. Oh, sure. It's so great to see you here tonight. And um, yeah, I, I was I was telling the truth. I don't think we've ever had a singer on before. So um, I, I won't ask you to sing because <laughs> I know you haven't prepared anything, but we might have to have you come back and do that for us. <laughs> I think that's great. And I imagine writing song. Did you did you write your own songs when you were? OK, and writing songs and writing picture books, there's a lot of similarities there. Right. So I imagine and it's that. the same as like, you know, in journalism as well. Like, you know, when you're writing yes. your stories, you go out, you know, it, it, it's like I, I actually had a presentation that I had created for uh, one of the uh, classrooms kind of showing kids what it was like to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. comparing my beat calls, which are like where I get my story ideas from to, you know, where we get our story ideas from when we're doing story storm or, you know, however you come up with your ideas, mm -hmm. whether it's 12 by 12 or on your own, um, you know, life experience and just comparing and seeing across the board, like how similar they are. And even in songwriting, how do you come up with, you know, what you're going to sing about? We always sing mm -hmm. about universal themes, love, heartbreak, right. you know, family. That's Other so things. true. That's 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 so true because I have we we have a lot of singer songwriters in my town, some of which are great, some of which not so much. And I find the ones I love are the ones you're right who have universal themes. The the ones who are singing about themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like I can handle it for one or two songs and then I'm over it. You know, yes. <laughs> I don't need to hear any more about you and your, you know, party escapades or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, you're right. You want you want to connect on an emotional level with the song as you do with with the picture book. So it's very, very similar. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about Goodnight Ganesha and and, uh, you know, in that link of interest, the article was about asking why do you why should you write this story and i bet that was a question that you answered for yourself as you were writing this because it does have a, a personal connection as well to you right mm -hmm. I, uh, good night ganesha is actually a bedtime story and mm -hmm. uh it came to me in rhyme so it ended up being a rhyming story originally and then we went into lyrical prose when uh I sent it out to my agent to make it my own and then it returned to rhyme which it feels it was supposed to be or it's meant to be because the editor asked for it in mm -hmm. rhyme but uh good night ganesha is based on my child's experience when we visit family overseas in india especially when we're at our nainama's house and so uh the funny thing about good night ganesha is that in our family it's just nainama because my father-in-law um, is no longer with us. He, he passed long before uh, my child was born and um, before we even got married. So he gave us, you know, his blessing. Unfortunately, uh, things happened the way that it did, but we incorporated him into the story because it's one of those things that we wanted to have it show what it would be like. And then Vikram is kind of the son I didn't have and that my child wanted a sibling, a brother, 
So I said, okay, well, we'll just put all these people in here. Right? That's what fiction <laughs> is all about. And so we wrote it from that. So it's it's emotional, it's heartfelt, it's you know, memorializing and um, you know, being wishful. And uh, we just incorporated those two extra uh, characters into the story. But normally when we're overseas with Nainama at her house doing bedtime mm -hmm. routine, it's usually with one of our aunties, Jayaka, that we run around, do all the, you know, the puja ceremonies and play tag with. So all, all the ladies gather into the foyer and we just run around and play tag mm -hmm. and um, get the kids tired and then send them off to bed and pretty much follow the same routine. And we do have a shy baby gecko that like actually lives in my room. And so everything that's in the book is really, you know, a part of our mm -hmm. routine. Right. And yet, um, you know, I've read a lot of manuscripts where people base the story on a very personal event or, or tradition or whatever. And it doesn't, it's like those songs I was talking about, you can't connect beyond the people who, who know them or who, who were involved. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. But you incorporated so many universal concepts and themes into this book. And that's what the publisher really uh, highlighted when they were sending out like review copies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got the bedtime routine, you've got family story, you've mm -hmm. got this wonderful read aloud quality to it. So um, did you, were you really focusing on making sure it had that appeal beyond your immediate family when you were writing it? Um, that's a really good question. When I wrote it, I was laser focused on the challenge for my child to write the story. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote it originally, I just wrote it as a hot potato, like I'm going to mimic what I read with um, Goodnight Moon because my kid loved Goodnight Moon, still does. And um, when I wrote the story, you know, I followed the format, but then when I made it my own, I was like, well, you know, everyone celebrates some kind of uh, bedtime routine or has a bedtime routine. And so I just thought I would share what you know our bedtime routine would be all about but it wasn't until i got into more of the editing process that i realized that you know while we're doing this i also invite you know this this was like you know the idea that the editor uh and i had discussed um to invite whoever's reading our story to be a part of the bedtime routine because i wanted to bring everyone with me on the ride so it it was more kind of like i'm inviting you into my home and we're going to do this together that was my idea originally and mm -hmm. then when we were going through the editing process then we were like well why don't we also invite people to also make it their own and so i think that's um that universality that we were talking about right. and that's how we ended up reaching extra outwardly to mm -hmm. um you know anyone who's reading this because we wanted everyone reading that story to feel a part of it and then to take mm -hmm. whatever they learned or realized to make it their own yes yes well and it's interesting that the universality works hand in hand with the culturally specific details and it gives that story yet another layer mm -hmm. because i think it's fascinating for kids say in the u.s who have never been to India or maybe don't know anyone from India to read this and realize how similar, mm -hmm. how much they have in common and yeah. yet still learn things about the Indian culture through the book. Right. And, and, and also the illustrations, which are incredible. You can see behind Nadia yeah. there, just one yeah. spread from the book. One spread. Yeah. The, uh, the they are just amazing. exquisite. Yes. And so uh, I think to me anyway, I imagine that was a big plus for the editor and the agent is that you had both universal themes and culturally specific detail that that make the book stand out and make it unique in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, I find that when I'm writing, I, I tend to write layered stories because mm -hmm. my life is layered, like everything I do is layered. I mean, everything you do is layered. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always this uh, if you're writing for children, you have to keep it super simple, super simplified. And I think we are doing kids a disservice by not giving them the opportunity to filter through the layers. Mm -hmm. Because 
for me, the, the, the books when, you know, my child and I were reading that we enjoyed the most were the ones that had the extra details or that extra like storyline or story loop um, as, as we know, like that can happen because more than one thing can happen in a story. Mm-hmm. And I feel that, um, you know, always focusing on keeping it super simple sometimes, you know, doesn't really quite get across to kids that life really isn't super simple as we all know, it's not because they live harried lives like daily. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, when you go to India and you visit family overseas, it's never, it's not, there's no such thing as simple. It's busy, right? Mm -hmm. You have, you know, the minute you wake up, like there's like all the exterior sounds, you have the smell, like the sensory details. And I just wanted to be given that opportunity to do it so it's it's not like I decided to do it I had to convince you know my editor whether it's this story or a different story that I'm working on to keep it layered because I think kids can actually filter through and like pick things out and then that's also what makes a book rereadable giving them an opportunity to okay we read the story we focused on the bedtime what else can we focus on Yes. So now we can go back and look at the art, how incredible it is and like the details in the art or, you know, the, the, it's not just the story of Ganesha watching over the, the good night game, but it's also that relationship with their grandparents, you know, that right. you can focus on that or the intimacy that they have with Nana in the puja room and what they do together. And then of course, at bedtime, when you're going to bed, like all the things that happen before you go to bed, you take mm-hmm. a bath, you know, you have your, sure. water, you know, whatever it is. Like for us, it's labouille or like, you know, soup or, you know, it, it's just whatever your, your traditions are. And mm-hmm. I just thought kids could actually um, enjoy that. They can, uh, they can sift through all of that and then like take whatever, mm-hmm. you know, storyline resonates with them the most. But I that's, really think that's... it's important. Yeah, that's very true. And there's humor in your book too, uh, which I which I love. And you're right. And it, that rereadability is so important. A publisher spends so much money mm-hmm. getting a picture book to market. People don't have don't even realize how expensive yeah. it is for the publisher. And they're not going to do that if someone's going to buy the book and read it once. Because mm-hmm. what parent is going to pay? 18 to 20 dollars for a hardcover right. picture book that they're going to read one time and then the kid's like okay i'm done right so you need to have those elements that the child wants to go back to and explore over and over the different layers it's right. very very important yeah so let's talk a little bit about getting your agent because i i really wanted to focus a lot tonight on sort of before and then after publication and I know that you made initial contact through a Twitter pitch party, but Goodnight Ganesha was not the manuscript that you were pitching. No. So tell us a little bit about how that worked. Okay. So um, as some of you may or may not know, um, I, I had 21 manuscripts to pitch. And mm-hmm. so I chose what I felt were my strongest contenders. So I chose probably like four or five manuscripts to pitch during that event. And uh, during that event, Goodnight Ganesha wasn't even, you know, uh, one of the manuscripts I pitched. I pitched like My Colorful World, My Haiti in Color. Um, I think there were like, uh, oh yeah, like uh, uh, one of my humor ones, which is still on the back burner right now, but it's like Move Over Simon. And then uh, two other books that, um, Oh, uh, Sun Sneaks Away and uh, there's one more, but I can't remember. But, you know, it, it I, I, I had like three pitches per manuscript set aside because, you know, you're supposed to have at least three different pitches because when you're pitching, you can't pitch the same or else Twitter uh, treats it as though it's spam. So it's always good to variate your mm-hmm. pitches. And so that day I was feeling... Um, I don't know, like very hot, like, you know, when you're having a good day and you're getting good vibes, like that was the kind of day. And then for whatever reason, I chose to wear my Star Wars t-shirt and I tell this story only because the first person who reached out to me to wish me luck was someone called Jedi Magic, who was like a total Star Wars fan. <laughs> and, and so I just felt like, okay, like, you know, the force was with me that day. And then I threw out my first pitch, which was for My Colorful World. 
And that was the pitch that um, I talked about. Um, silver is like the color of my Chaley's anklets. And like, you can hear it jingle when we play. And um, I invited the reader to be a part of um, an Indian American child's experience see color through an Indian American child's experience. Mm -hmm. And so this story itself is very layered because that story deals with Sankranti, um, you know, a wedding and a child visiting India during that time. Mm -hmm. And so it's very multi-layered and, you know, we've had interest and, you know, it's still in submission rounds right now, but it was not, you know, the manuscript that, um, you know, obviously like Goodnight Ganesha is the manuscript we, we sent out, but that was not the only manuscript we went out with after, mm -hmm. you know, pitching. So when I sent Joan my manuscript after um, she faved it, I responded immediately, which is the reason why I tell everyone, if you're going to pitch, make sure you're pitching, you know, a polished work. Do not pitch a work in progress. Do not right. pitch a story that you're kind of iffy about, you, you know, you're not sure or, you're just doing it so that you can light a fire to get you motivated. It doesn't mm -hmm. work that way because yeah. think of it as an opportunity to present your best foot forward because of the investment of time, not just by you, but also by the person you're submitting it to because mm -hmm. agents and editors are very busy people mm -hmm. and you don't want to hurt your chances even in the future. So right. you want to make sure everything that you're sending them, you send it right away and it's your best work. So when Joan saw the manuscript, she really loved it. She asked me for more samples of my work. And then I, and then when she asked me, you know, what can I send her? I said, um, well, how many manuscripts do you want? And so she asked me, well, how many do you have? And I said, well, I have 21. And she was like, oh, okay. And she's like, <laughs> all of them are polished. And I was like, yes, ma'am, all of them are polished. Wow. And so uh, she asked me to send her to pick like my top, you know, five, six, you know, that I want to send her. So then I picked, you know, my top five, six, and then I sent them to her. And then after that, she sent me a message. It was either end of day or the next day. And she was like, can I just see like all the stuff that you're working on? And I said, sure. How would you like me to send it? Cause you know, it's that, that's a lot of manuscripts. So I think I dropboxed her or I sent her a link to a drive and um, gave her my manuscripts. And literally uh, within a day or two, she was like, Hey, let's have a conversation. And so for me, that was the call. Sure. And when I got the call, of course, you know, we had a conversation, one thing led to another. And like I've said to people before, I was at the point when I had that conversation with Joan, where I was really like dejected because I had gotten so much rejection and so many people telling me, oh, you know, I love your writing, but like, you know, they're not in love with my work or they didn't really mm -hmm. see the vision. So when Joan was really serious about it, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Like, but I felt like I wasn't as serious maybe as I should have been in the conversation. And I just thought maybe it, like, I'm like, I don't even know. Right. Yeah. And so when we had the conversations and it, she said certain things that like, I had not heard from other agents before where they're, um, Joan is Amy Joan Paquette or Amy Joan Paquette. She's with Erin Murphy Literary Agency. So she is my agent. And I love her to pieces because she has changed my life in ways um, so incredible that I can't even, um, you know, I, I, I can't even explain. Not just um, as a friend, not just as my agent, but just she's an overall great human being. And if she loves your work, she believes in your work, she will basically um, fight tooth and nail to get you published, to get mm -hmm. your story on a bookshelf. So my experience with Joan has been nothing but positive, mm -hmm. but it's the questions that she asked me, like, where do you see yourself um, uh, a few years from now? How do you see yourself debuting? So it wasn't dollar signs. It wasn't, oh, how many manuscripts can I sell for you or where I can place this? It was, what do you want to do? What do you want to get out of this? And um, that for me resonated so much more. And then she talked to me about my vision and her vision for where she sees my career going. So when you're vying for an agent, A, you want to make sure that 
you can, you can have honest and open communication because that is something that was a concern for me because, you know, I'm BIPOC, which means, you know, I'm an author who is from um, a Black Indigenous person of color background. And so I come with a lot of baggage, sadly. Um, and, you know, positively, because like we're trying to write stories so that our children, other people can see what our lives are like. But that baggage is when certain agents, certain editors will say to you, hey, I want this story. And then you present it to them. Then they tell you, oh, like it's either not commercial enough or they want you to, you know, um, change it so to make it commercial. But they don't right. accept it 100 percent like Liza did for Goodnight Ganesha. I mean, mm -hmm. this was probably I, I feel very fortunate because this is an experience where it's unheard of. Um, what I went through, uh, how this project happened, because I was afforded voice. Mm. I was afforded the opportunity to comment on, um, you know, certain illustrations, like if I had an issue with it, um, which I didn't because the person who illustrated Punam is, of course, Telugu. So, you know, I trusted her wholeheartedly. We only had two things where we were like, hey, can we flip this or that or fix it? Because um, we know it's accurate, but if we do it this way, then we don't want to offend, you know, because we're dealing with idols. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had to make sure like the order was correct in that respect. But, um, you know, details about like, how will people be influenced or how will they view the story? So we were very careful in how we chose to market the story as well. I had a say in that because at the time, you know, people were still using own voices and like multicultural and like certain hot key terms that I'm like, for someone like me, like the word diverse, I don't feel like that is appropriate because that's othering me, othering my culture. Mm -hmm. And so I would rather if we're going to um, publish this book, I mean, this book is about, you know, a bedtime routine. It's about um, you know, a relationship between grandparents and their grandchildren. And mm -hmm. it's a rhyming story. And why should you give it multicultural, diverse, own voices as a marketing term, but it's really doing right. a disservice to the book, even though the intent behind it is good, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was great having this experience because um, they afforded me the opportunity to say, hey, like they involved me basically. And they wanted to get it right. And mm -hmm. that for me means so much more like, I don't know how well this book is going to do. I don't, you know, for me, it's not about money. It's not about any of that. It's just about my kids being able to see themselves on the shelves. I still can't do that. Yeah. I'm multiracial. I still can't go out and look at a bookshelf and be like, oh, that that's about my family. It's not there. Mm -hmm. It has to be written. And the only person who could ever put that on the shelf, like my kid told me, is you, mommy, because you're yeah. the writer. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Well, it's it sounds like it was meant to be. I mean, right. the way everything fell together. And that's such a wonderful message for you to be giving to the people listening here, especially those who have been submitting, submitting, submitting. How many, how long had you been submitting your manuscripts before you finally found the right agent, do you think? Oh, wow. Uh, I've been submitting since 2014, even when I wasn't ready. Mm. And we all right. know we've done that, right? Yes. It's yes. like a 1200 word manuscript. Now I know better. It's like, shame on you. You shouldn't do that. Mm. But, you know, before then, before you start, well, before I even started SCBWI, you know, which is the Society of uh, children's um, book writers and illustrators, you know, before I even was involved in that, um, I was sending stuff out, stuff I probably had no business sending out. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, hey, I wrote a great story. Like, you know, how can they not love it? And you send it out and they're like, you know, the rejection letters that you get are just the forms back right. in the day, right? Yeah. The, 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 the form letters that they mail you and you're like, oh yeah, that's not good. So then you go back and you're like, well, how do I improve my writing? So then mm -hmm. I went to my local library and then started looking at picture books and seeing how they were written. And then, you know, whatever story ideas I had, I would write, revise. And mm -hmm. then um, when I joined SCBWI in 2015, I met uh, Bitsy Kemper. 
Betsy Kemper uh, was at Spring Spirit and she was one of the RAs for that region at the time. And uh, she literally took me and walked me to my sessions. And by the end of the day, after I got my critique and I was looking at it, I was like, so like, just, oh my God, this is like so bad. And, you know, I chatted with her, we, I stayed behind and she just gave me all sorts of tips, advice, guidance that, you know, you normally wouldn't get from anyone. I mean, I come from right. a news background. It, everyone's caddy. It's like a very tough business. Everyone's your competition. Whereas in the writing world or publishing world, no one's your competition. We're all in it together and we're very supportive. And that was like a big deal for me because I had never had that experience before. Mm -hmm. And then when Bitsy said to me, the only person who can get from where you are right now to published is you. You have to put in the work. You have to do the legwork. You have to learn the craft. You have to learn the business. Mm -hmm. And so um, she said, if you do all that I'm telling you, I guarantee you, because you seem very determined that you can get it done within, you know, two, three years max. Mm -hmm. And she's like, some people do it in longer, but she's like, if you're dedicated, determined, no more than that. And so mm -hmm. honestly, that's exactly what happened. You know, I joined SCBWI in March of 2015. By April of 2018, I was agented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I put the work in. I put, put the, the work in. in. You treated it like a business too. It wasn't, it, 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 it was not a hobby. It was a business. You right. were going to learn it. You were going to invest by going right. to the conferences and doing these things and taking it seriously and taking advice. Right. So you were doing all the things that you're supposed to do. And right. I'm so happy that it worked. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have a success story to, to tell. Yes. Right. And then it's the same thing too. Like, you know, your critique groups, like don't join a critique group just to, you know, get, get critiqued for your work critique groups, like, I feel like the stronger your critique group is in terms of um, relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they become your, fa your, your family, because when your family um, thinks you're, like, insane for sitting at your computer, and, like, looking at a blank screen, wondering, like, well, what, what are you writing? Like, what are you doing? Like, they don't get it. You can go to your critique group, and, like, they're my moms that I go to. They're my sure. sisters that I go to. They're my family who understand like the writing process. Like they understand mm -hmm. rejection like no one else. They understand, yes. you know, setbacks like no one else. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have like mindsets and we, um, you know, it's basically they're, they're your, your, your village. You know, the people right. that really understand everything that you're going through and they can help talk you off the ledge when you're like I'm done I'm gonna throw in the towel and they're the ones who are like hey you know what we know the rejection was bad you know it, it, it hurt a lot but you know what it's a learning experience and what everyone is going to learn the closer you get to publication that's what they call the champagne rejections and those are the rejections mm -hmm. where um, you're getting actual responses not form letters Right. from editors or agents. They're actual responses where you built a connection with that person and they're saying to you, hey, I love your writing, but you know, this may not fit my um, my list at the moment, but you know, maybe I'd like to look at some more of your work. And so that's how I ended up meeting people, networking with like editors, agents, and um, knowing who's open to, you know, what kinds of stories the manuscript wish list that's your best friend that is mm -hmm. the place to go to where you want to find out the who's who of the business what they're looking for sometimes it's outdated but it's okay to go to the current website and look and see what this person is looking for mm -hmm. but um that's how i ended up um getting to where i am right now networking meeting people and putting myself out there do you know how many rejections yep. i've gotten i mean i'm like Karen Boss at Charles Bridge Publishing, <laughs> like I've done so many programs with her, same thing with Melissa Manlove, where, um, you know, they, they like my writing, but we still haven't figured something out yet, yes. yet, yet. Good, yet. But, well, and, and that's a part of the industry that a lot of yeah. people who are new don't really understand. An editor may love your writing, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't fit with the focus of their list 
Love or if it. they don't have a slot for your book for the next five years because they're already full, you know, they, they can't give you a contract. So there's so many factors that go into it right. beyond whether or not you've crafted a great manuscript. And so learning that, I think it, it doesn't make it easier, but it might take some of the sting out mm -hmm. knowing that it wasn't because you didn't write well enough. It was because it just, the stars hadn't aligned properly. <laughs> right. And then the other thing too, is like, sometimes, you know, just because they say no to one project, mm -hmm. don't feel like that the door has shut for you immediately. Right. Right. You, you can just, you know, bounce back immediately and say, Oh, I know, you, I know this manuscript didn't work for you, but you know, would you consider this? Like it right. could be something that you're working on. That's a draft. I mean, I, I got to a point with a manuscript with a uh, Charles Bridge that um, it, it even went up to acquisitions, but you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, it, 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 it didn't get an offer. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that my relationship with Karen is over? No, you still maintain your relationship. You still, um, you know, chit chat. And, you know, I, I keep like everyone that I have ever submitted to, I hang out with them on socials or like I comment on them. It's, it's not, like they're so above you that you can't maintain a relationship they remember you yes right good etiquette helps people to remember you so yes it's like we're having a conversation right now mm -hmm. keep having those conversations that's how you build your your base that's how you build Absolutely. your your audience and i mean i wouldn't be having this you know conversation with laura if we didn't do pb summit or like um I think I had submitted like, hey, I have great news. You did, yeah. And, yeah. Right. And then mm -hmm. that's how like we built a relationship. And then one thing leads to another. It's okay to have conversations. They're real people just like you. Yes. Right. And, and so that's what you have to think about. And publishing is built, it's an industry built on people who like to communicate. Right. Whether it's through the written word or, you know, tweets or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're all communicators. So just keep communicating. That's all this is. It's yeah. just connections. And you're right, do it in, in the friendliest way possible, because publishing is basically built on very nice people. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, you're right, editors remember, and if they loved your work enough to get it to acquisitions, even if you didn't get a contract, they're going to remember you. Yeah. And you want to keep that connection going for sure. Yeah. Well, you were generous enough to share your query letter with us, and I wanted to show that on the screen because uh, this is the one that, let's see if I pull it up. Oh, let me go back to the slides here, and then I will, uh, that you sent to your agent after the Twitter, after she liked your pitch on the Twitter pitch party. Yes. Right. So I think this is such a great, it's, you know, a query letter is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward, right. but you hit all the right notes here. And I really think that had a lot to do with it. So first you are reminding her right. of your pitch from the Twitter, from PitMad, which I think is really important. You always want to tell an agent why you are querying them. And uh, so it so it doesn't seem like you just went through manuscript wish lists and sent out queries to every name you could find. There has to be some personal reason. Here, she liked your pitch, so you are uh, reminding her. Mm -hmm. And then you have the little. Um, uh, well, go ahead. You why don't you walk us through? Okay, this? I'll walk you through it. Um, first of all, I wanted to say I looked at my query letter. Uh, on uh, query, uh, uh, what is it, query shark? Like I looked at uh, all kinds of query letters before I, I formatted my own query uh, mm -hmm. letter uh, by looking at Janet Reed's uh, query shark website. So mm -hmm. that is where I learned to write my query letters, even though like, you know, I, I went to conferences and participated in um, Big Sur with Andrea Brown Agency. That's another uh, place where um, the, 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 Agents there are super when it comes to teaching you how to mm -hmm. uh, write yeah. query letters. So I, I'd say those were the two key places that I always paid attention to what they were saying about queries. And then in my letter, um, you know, I originally addressed it to Joan. So I said, dear, you know, Joan, thank you for taking the time to favorite my pit mad pitch. 
My Colorful World, which is the name of the manuscript. And so that is currently in submission rounds. And then I cut and paste the actual pitch so that she could remember what pitch she faved. So the pitch is Silver is Mike Chavey's melodic anklets that jingle when we play, explore color through the eyes of an Indian American child in my colorful world. And then I used the hashtags, which were pit mad, um, which is the place where you're doing your pitch, PB for picture book. And then at the time, DV, which was for diverse, and then own for own voices, um, we were using those. And then after I had pitched, I realized, you know, maybe those weren't appropriate for me. So I don't use them at all. Mm, okay. Uh, for, for anything. And so uh, then I just told her, please find enclosed the 452 word color themed picture book manuscript that's geared towards ages four to eight years old, because I'm telling her like who my target audience is, mm -hmm. and then what my what the purpose of my manuscript is to explore color culturally, sensorially, you know, through the senses. And um, since we don't all experience color in the same way, because when I was writing this manuscript, I realized red has significance in so many different ways in so many different cultures, hmm. including my own, including Hindu culture, including, you know, um, any Asian culture and American culture. We associate it with anger, whereas it's joy, luck, good fortune, like in, in hmm. other places. And right. then, of course, you know, the universal, which is love. Right. And mm -hmm. so I thought, oh, it'd be cool to write a book about that experience. So that's why mm -hmm. I, I wrote that manuscript and I pitched it. And so, um, uh, no, enclosed is spelled correctly. It just looks funny over here, but it's spelled correctly. I promise you. Oh um, yeah. It's just the way that the yeah, screenshot yeah, it, it was, made. It got, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I said the manuscript is currently under publication consideration because at the time, um, it was being considered by, um, an editor at one publishing house and another editor at a different publishing house. And then I mentioned what was different about the manuscript, which is I included Telugu words, script, pronunciation, and meaning for each color, which is, you know, going to be the glossary and, you know, interesting facts in the back of the book. And the setting is in San Francisco, but it can be anywhere, USA, Boston, New York, Chicago, because, you know, we have um, a large population of, um, you know, Indian Americans in those areas, mm -hmm. including Hyderabad, because I'm open to the story taking place overseas, because that's really where the story took place anyway. So why not tell the story from that right. um, region? And then I said, it's written in the spirit of my mentor texts, which are the mentor texts that I chose to, um, you know, that are currently on the market, but that give them an idea of what to expect in the story. Red is a Dragon, Green is a Chili Pepper, and Golden Domes and Silver Lanterns, which are books about different cultures, you know, different religions, and um, color association uh, mm -hmm. with each of these. And then, of course, you keep your background short. Like, you don't want your letter to be more than a page long, because who's going to read it, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to be able to hit all the formats really quickly, and then, you know, get a sense of who you are. So I told them that my background is in germ journalism and public policy. I'm not detailing my you know curriculum vitae so it's like i'm an active of an active member of scbwi 12 by 12 i attend conferences to let them know um where you know that that i'm serious about my writing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that you know i'm not just a fly by night kind of person this is something that i've invested a lot of time in and that i participate in critique groups right. so i've seen cover letters where people think you know two three pages i'm like no they just want a format it's kind of like I, I had this conversation with another writer earlier where we were talking about um, universities and sometimes in their programs, they will ask you to follow directions and they mean follow directions. So if they mm -hmm. say to you, the format is A, B, C, and then you give them C, B, A, you automatically fail. Even if the information is accurate, even if the information is correct, you get an F because you didn't follow directions. Right. So you need to give it to them in the format of A, B, C. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I urge you, like when you're writing it, keep it super short unless something is stated otherwise on the requesting website or wherever you're yes. getting your information to submit. Absolutely. And, you know, as you said, agents and editors are very busy people. They're they're getting hundreds of these a month, if not more. And 
granted this was one she requested from you so that's great so she wanted to see the manuscript but your pitch this is such a great letter for so many reasons first of all it highlights that the idea behind your book was so good it's hard to write a great query on a bad manuscript <laughs> and sometimes people do but then the editor is let down when they read the actual manuscript or the agent. Right. But it this just shows that your idea had a hook. It had something interesting and different about it, but it fit into an established market. There's a very specific audience for this book. You're going to approach the, I mean, the topic of color. I mean, that's a concept that has been done for decades in children's books, but you're going about it in a unique way. And there's going to be a glossary. There's going to be back matter. That's that's a big deal right now. Editors are really looking for back matter on fiction and nonfiction. So you hit all the right notes as far as this fitting into your idea fits the market right now. And I think that is is also a, something that I, I want people listening to to be aware of that, you know, once you have a great idea and then you craft this terrific query or cover letter, you've got a, a win, but it's got to start with a great manuscript. And you had that clearly, and, and your agent recognized that here. Yeah. And then she wanted more. And that's another really interesting point for people to understand. If you are especially submitting querying agents on picture books, they want to know you have at least three manuscripts polished and ready to go. Uh, with novels, you want to have one done and you want to have another one pretty far along at least mm -hmm. uh so that they know you're not a one hit run wonder they agents want to you know be with you for your career not for a book and so that's really important to them and you had 21 which i have never heard yeah. <laughs> anybody having that many that's remarkable yeah. it I really 21 is one and she um you know accepted 20 and one of them she out and out was like I don't want to call it a rejection, but he was like, that needs to be on the back burner. She's like, we've got plenty to work with. <laughs> but that 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 other one was one of those, you know, um, even though it was a polished manuscript, but it felt too preachy because it was mm. about bullying. And so uh, she was like, uh, we have plenty of those on the market right now. So like, right. let's just focus on some of the other unique, different mm -hmm. uh, stories that you're writing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, now I want to touch on, I'm going to stop sharing this so I can pull up your website here. I want to show, I mean, you, so you got the contract. Mm -hmm. Awesome book came out and you got the amazing illustrator. And I can imagine how thrilling that was for you. Uh, and, and then the book comes out. So you have been on a whirlwind of promotion, um, not just since you came out, but in the weeks leading up to your book launch. And what I want to do is just share a page of your website so people can see. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, the, the illustrations are amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is from, in, by the way, your website's amazing. I love it. And I, I yeah. everyone needs to go check it out because it is just so well designed and so professional. And people say, well, what can I put on my website if I only have one book? Well. Nadia has plenty, uh, but I can be honest with you, um, Laura, like when I first started mm -hmm. um, doing all of this, I had I had nothing to talk mm -hmm. about because I was pre-published. So yes. originally everything was just all my news stuff, sure. like the news stories that I had written, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, some of the uh, events that I had done. Mm -hmm. And then um, my announcement, my my announcement of Goodnight Ganesha was probably one of the first things that I put on there that made me like mm -hmm. look like an author, even though I was, you know, right. And, and see, I, I have to stop myself and say, I am an author because whoever is writing a book, you're an author because you're Absolutely. authoring something. Yes. So, so don't say, oh, I'm not an author yet. Even though like, you know, we are saying like, yes, my book came out on the 31st and I'm officially an author, but you are an author from the minute that you start writing something. So you need to believe that instead of just saying, oh, I'm pre-published. It, it doesn't matter. Those are all just like little adjectives, extra words, but mm -hmm. you are an author the minute that you're writing, you're sending your material out 
And even though you don't have a deal, an offer or anything, you are an author, you're working on a book. So um, treat it as though it's a real gig for you, even if it's part time, even if it's, you know, a hobby or whatever. But the more and more you do, like you, you, you put every little thing that you're doing that's related to your writing up on your website, then editors, agents will see that you're serious about it and they will treat you like the author that you um, are saying that you are. Absolutely. so don't sell Absolutely. yourself short just because you're pre-published. That's right. It's just yes. a term. I totally agree. I totally agree. So tell us about some of these interesting events you have here. So audio listening party. Right. I've never seen this. This is amazing. So what was this? Okay. This, okay. 2018 was like a crazy year. 2018 <laughs> was the year that I, I um, met uh, Chrissy uh, or Christina Gray, who's also an author. And um, we became uh, critique par uh, partners and now we're just family. So, uh, and Terry, I had met at Big Sur uh, when we did the um, Andrea Brown, uh, it, you know, they, they, every year they do like those two events, like pre-pandemic with like, mm -hmm. um, you know, you go to a remote location and then you learn the business. And so I right. had met Terry there. Uh, I think 2015 was the year I met Terry. And in 2018, I was meeting my agent for the first time, Joan, and um, I could barely talk to, to Joan. And I remember uh, that night we were talking about, um, you know, uh, what books we have and what stories we're working on. And then I told them about Goodnight Ganesha. And I was like, hey, do you guys want to hear my bedtime story? And Chrissy was like, sure, I'd love to hear your bedtime story. And Terry was like, I'm tired enough to just like fall asleep to it. Let's go. So we go back to, you know, my hotel room and um, we, we sat on the bed. I broke out my laptop and then Chrissy was like, guys, I have a feeling. And I'm just, I'm, this is, this is like, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to manifest this, but she's like, I need to take a picture of tonight. And I was like, okay, sure. No problem. So Chrissy takes the picture, set it, forget it. Fast forward to after my cover reveal, a couple of, um, like a, a, about a month later, they tell me that, hey, we want to do an audio version of your book. And I thought to myself, oh, that's cool. So then I went back and I asked people, hey, it, like, what does that mean? And everyone's like, hey, if they're doing an audio book for your book, that's a great thing. And so I mentioned that back to Chrissy and I said, hey, Chrissy, do you still have that picture? Because mm -hmm. remember, I, you know, I'm just trying to find things that are of interest or I think would be cool for other people to participate in. And I said to her, if you can find that picture, maybe we could have an audio listening party because the first time we ever heard the book was me reading it to you guys, like all sprawled out, like in my room. Right. And, and why don't we, we do something about it? And then Chrissy was like, I'm not going to say I told you so, but Hey, I'll go. <laughs> that picture. So Chrissy went, she found the picture and I thought, you know, since penguins like going through you know, this whole process and they're, they're turning it into an audio book. I decided to turn that into an event. So I, I, I mean, I'm not a pro at marketing. Like I, I, I will not say that I am. I just do what comes naturally or like whatever crazy idea comes to my mind. I'm like, Hey, and if I can find like one other person to join me, it's like, yeah, yeah, know, why not? And so that's how that picture came to be. And then we took the, um, we decided to do a listening party of Kim Singh actually reading Goodnight Ganesha. So we listened to it. I shared it in that video. And then we talked about like all the behind the scenes stuff. And then, you know, just our thoughts about Kim, what her voice sounded like, how it complemented the book and the story. And we just sat like we're sitting right now, just chatting and having a good time. And then I just turned it into a video and shared it with everybody else. Because I figured amazing. if it's interesting to us, well, maybe other people might be interested. That's great. That is such a great idea. So here's some of your other big ideas here. So yeah. look at this. Now, your book came out August 31st. Mm -hmm. And yet you had all of these things happen before then. So leading yeah. up to the launch. Now, is that important uh, yes. to get that buzz going before the book even hits the stores? Yes, your buzz should be going the minute your cover reveal comes out. So mm -hmm. my cover reveal came out in February. 
And mm -hmm. even then I felt I'm still behind the eight ball because there's a lot of stuff that I was doing last minute. So that mm -hmm. I probably should have done in the time where I was trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the minute that you know that your book is coming out or you have a cover to share, that's when you should start talking about your book, building buzz about your book, um, talking to people. So for example, all these people like Nancy Tupper Link for Author Acrostics, she's part of my agency and, you know, we chat all the time. And um, I didn't even know she did Author Acrostics. And she was like, hey, I do this. Do you want to be a part of it? And my answer to any question that someone invites you to something, the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> my mom, she always tells me if someone takes the time to invite you, that means that you have some kind of significance or they like something about you enough to say, hey, I'd like to invite you into my circle. And she says, just say yes. And she's like, and if you have to say regrets, give a good reason why you're going to have regrets. But she's like, the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. So I just said yes to everybody who asked me. And at one point when everyone was trying to schedule, I was like, oh my goodness, where am I going to find all this time? And so I just blocked it like one week, at, you know, days apart, like however I could find the time. And they made a commitment to me. And so I made a commitment back, like Debbie Ridbath Ogi. I met her mm -hmm. at SCBWI LA. And the mm -hmm. first year that I met her, like everyone's like, how, how do you know Debbie? And I'm like, we have the same glasses. <laughs> she was wearing green I was wearing green we took a picture of both of us with like you know these green glasses and we became we were fast friends ever since then and so Storyteller Academy I met Ari Chung like at my local community center talking about his book like right. when he first started with the ninja series and then we talked about Storyteller Academy so that's how I know Ari, mm -hmm. and then I've come to know like everyone behind Storyteller Academy. Kidlet411 with Sylvia. Sylvia, I just reached out to her like every time I have a question or I need anything for Kidlet411 because I always pay attention to that page. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I've won a couple of books from them and I just keep track of everyone. And, you know, yeah. you see someone having success, it's okay to pause your life and say, congratulations, because you know what? One day that's going to be you. And so exactly. it's important to support everyone. And if you like something, say you like it. It's okay because mm -hmm. that's how you build relationships with people. That's how I know so many people. Andrew mm -hmm. Hackett, I know him because when he was first starting out backstory, he was wondering, why should I do that? And I'm like, do you realize how, like, even though it may seem like there's a lot going on, we don't have a program like that, that talks about the backstory behind the book. And I'm like, it would be wonderful, you know, for you to do that. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, you're not stepping on anyone's toes. I'm like, the whole point of this community is for us to learn from each other. Go for it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. And then right. so he, he, he just started doing it and I kept following him. And then when he realized that I had a book coming out and he asked me, I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Right. So it's just... <laughs> you know, I, I feel like the more you give to this community, the more you support people in the community, um, you know, people will remember you. And I mean, that's how I remember all these people who helped me along the way, whether mm -hmm. it's Sam at like, you know, SCBWI, like Sam and I, through the pandemic, we became close because I started hobnobbing with like all the SCBWI regions. And I knew she did the birthday blog, but then I said to her, hey, can we add a live element to it? hey, can we do a video element to it? And she's like, I've never done it before. And I'm like, so let's do it. And we just did it. And now like it may become a thing if we get people who ask us, hey, can you guys like host me, right? Sure. If we have time. So it's just a matter of like, you know, all of this stuff that I have on the site, Janet Sumner Johnson, like I had a conversation with her because she had written a piece on her blog because I was reading it. And there was something in there that I um, felt very strongly about and I asked her you know to consider either rewriting it or you know changing it because this is the impact and so we had a conversation behind the scenes and she actually went back and she corrected you know the error and then um ever since then we've been you know chatting and we talk about stuff because I said to her I don't want us to be in this environment where you know we have uncomfortable conversations I want us to be able sure. to have conversations where like everyone feels like hey 
you know, what you're writing, maybe, you, you know, you might think you're helping, but like, on the grand scheme of things, it's, it's really not helpful. Like, can, can we find a way to fix it? And she was so agreeable. And um, she was so great about it, that um, she was like, Oh, my God, I'm so glad you told me that because no one else said, you know, spoke up and said anything. And mm -hmm. she's like, they'd probably just criticize me instead of just telling me what was wrong. Uh -huh. So we had that conversation. And then later on down the line, she reached out to me. She was like, hey, um, you know, I know you have a book coming out. Would you like to be on my blog? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, and it's the same thing with like Flashlight Books. You know, it's a place I frequent all the time. Um, Danville Library, that was the library where I actually sat and I wrote, you know, pretty much most of my manuscripts. And my librarians were like, hey, we know you're like now like this big celebrity with like books coming out. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, I'm still Nadia. And they're like, well, you know, whose library are you going to go to to like, you know, do your virtual events? And I'm like, uh, here, right? <laughs> so they were like, we want you to do it with us, nobody else. And I was like, you guys always have first dibs because they were there for me from day one when mm -hmm. I would leave my kid in like, you know, the steam room to, to do steam projects while I'm like researching and working mm -hmm. on my manuscripts. Right. Story time with Deshi Book Auntie. I love her to death. Gayatri has just shown me so much love, um, embraced me, embraced my family, um, invited me into the Deshi fold and, you know, has given me community that I sometimes don't feel that I even have within my own community. So, um, you know, all these people like Homer Library, like I ended up going to Alaska virtually because I used to be a reporter in Fairbanks, Alaska. And as a reporter in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, I covered news like pretty much, you know, for the whole state. But um, when I reached out during Brad, OK, I was not I, I, I like my book was not even out when I participated in Brad, which is World Read Aloud Day. So mm -hmm. even if you're pre-published or your book's not coming out yet, or you're, you don't even have a book, you could still read stories to kids, to schools, to libraries. Sure. So I threw my hat in the ring with uh, Melissa Stewart, you know, how she has that post inviting authors to participate. I threw my hat in the ring. So this is why I say to you, audacity, okay? Mm -hmm. So my dad's like, when you're in the, in the coop, like you just walk like a rooster and you own it. Because he's like, when you own it, he's like, even though on the inside you may be dying, but when you own it and you show people that like, you know what, I may not know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it anyway. He's like, that's like obnoxious audacity. And he's like, and if you don't fall on your face, you're the rooster. There right? you go. <laughs> you the coop because you said you're going to do something. You went out, you took the steps that were necessary to do it and mm -hmm. you did it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and he's like, you don't have to have a big head or be proud or like whatever. But he's like, if you say you're going to do something, maintain that confidence to do it. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I had no idea what I was going to do. I sold out like, you know, even, you know, Melissa and all these other people who, you know, they have actual books. I had nothing, nothing. And I had to go back to the editor and I'm like, hey, I, I have like, 15 reads for world read aloud day i'm like but i don't have a book <laughs> like <laughs> what, you know can you give me advice like what can i read to them so then they gave me like different book choices and i picked three and then i went back to the schools and everyone that i reached out to because that's what i did right i sent an email to uh the mississippi school districts like for the you know in the areas that i worked in uh, south carolina all the boston school system and um you know, Alaska, like I sent a letter to each of them and said, hey, I used to be a reporter. Exactly. Don't be afraid to fail. Never give up. That's exactly what, you know, Matthew McConaughey says to everyone. It's like, if you don't fail, then you will never know what success is. And he's right. You know, and that's what my dad taught me. It's like, you have to fail to succeed. And so I just took a leap of faith and said, you know what, I'm just going to put myself out there and I'm going to tell them I'm going to read for World Read Aloud Day you know, how would you like me to read to your classrooms? Believe you me, I got emails upon emails of like, hey, I want, I, come read to our school, come read to our district. So for World Read Aloud Day, I didn't have a book. I didn't have anything. So I just used whatever the editors suggested. I gave them as choices. And then I listed it on my website. 
And from there, when they found out my book was coming out, they were like, hey, we really like the read that you did for us for World Read Aloud Day. Mm -hmm. You know, when your book comes out, can we do an event together? Sure. And I was like, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So everything that you do, which you're very good at, is just getting on the radar. You are just, and you're doing it not in a self-serving way. You're doing it because you are connecting, you are supporting the other authors, you are supporting the library or your local bookstore. So, but, but you're on the radar and people want to then support you. It's, it's a very give and take industry. And none of this costs any money nope none of it i mean it's your time but nope. again we're all communicators so this is right. just part of that process right. and none of this the publisher did for you you did all of this on your own yes these right here that you see on my screen are mm-hmm. all events that i lined up all events that fell into my lap all events that, you know, um, I, I would say most of the people here are friends, you know, um, acquaintances, mm-hmm. uh, people I've made connections with through uh, different conferences and um, Flashlight Books. Like we we had hired Flashlight Books because I'm in um, a co-ARA for the SCBWI region for Northern California for um, SF Northeast Bay. And uh, Flashlight Books had done a uh, virtual, not a virtual, it was like an in-person launch for one of my critique partners. And then I really liked how they handled everything. And so when we had our big conference, which is usually uh, Oktoberfest, it's Mm -hmm. usually the third October um, annually, but this year we're, you know, because of the pandemic, like everything's on hold. But um, I had invited Shoshana to come and participate or be the the library, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, bookstore that we wanted to work with for the conference. And so um, they came, they did a great job and everybody really loved them. And just because like they had such a great um, relationship with everyone, when I was, uh, you know, I, I found out like, okay, my book's gonna be coming out and then I have to do a virtual book launch. How am I gonna handle, you know, book signings or like, you know, who would be my indie? But I know so many people and I go to so many virtual events or in-person events with, Flashlight, Mrs. Dalloway's, um, you know, Bell and Bunna, Barnes and Noble in Dublin. And I'll tell you the story about Barnes and Noble in Dublin. I like literally just walked in and just commented on the back wall. And the woman asked me like, how do you know so much about books? And I said to her, well, because I, I'm a writer and I have a book coming out. And she goes, really? What is it called? And I was like, um, it's called Goodnight Ganesha. And she's like, do you know the ISBN number? I'm like, no, I just found out that it's coming out. I don't know, but I'm like, I can pull it up on Amazon for you. So I pull it up for her. She, she enters it into her system and she's like, great, we'll order some because you're a local author. And I was like, really? And she was like, yes, really. We love our local authors. And she was like, do you want to come and do a signing and all that? I mean, she, like, I didn't ask her anything. She basically was just so thrilled that My kid was like looking through books and that I was talking to her about books and um, just that shared love for Mm -hmm. picture books and Mm -hmm. um, seeing how uh, the industry is changing and the bookshelves are getting, um, you know, diversified, which is Mm -hmm. a more appropriate way to use the word diverse bookshelves. Um, we, We connected. And so that's how I ended up with like my first true book signing. And they had uh, my book in the store literally two days before it actually released before flashlight asked me to come in and sign my book (laughs) so it it, it's just having conversations with people sure and and being genuine because like i didn't walk in there to it to be like oh i'll just talk about you know myself and my book it was just my mind was just completely blown when i saw the back wall and i was just like wow because Mm -hmm. they literally had everybody's book yeah you know, on the shelves. And it was just such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, I think, and, and I do want to get, we have a couple questions here that I want to get to, and we've kept you so long and I appreciate your time, but this has been such an amazing conversation. I appreciate it, but it's what you're very good at. And I think people who are good at making connections do this. They share a little bit of themselves with every connection, but not in a promotional way, not let me tell you about what I want to sell you, but just this is who I am. 
and and I'm just putting it out there. And I think if we are open to that, whether it's online or in person, as you did when you walked into Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. people respond to that. And if they don't, that's okay. You haven't lost anything. Right. But it opens the door for these wonderful opportunities that seem to fall in your lap, but not really because you have laid the groundwork for them. Right. Yeah. It, it feels like it's fallen in your lap, but like at the same time, um, you know, if, if you don't create connections with people, sure. like people won't know to ask you or think about you. So, yes. you know, all of my, yeah, just say yes. That is the new <laughs> mantra. Yes. Just say yes. Because even with my friends, like right now, like I have, um, you know, that book drive that I'm trying to do for the pajama program. And, and I'm going to tell you, like the pajama program didn't know me from Adam when I reached out to them. Mm -hmm. I reached out to them because I had seen, um, you know, during the pandemic through remote learning um, that uh, my kid was really disengaged during the pandemic. And so mm -hmm. it was like pulling teeth just to get them online, participate um, in school. But then um, you know, we started seeing these different programs, Pajama Program, Story App Live, and like, um, uh, there's one that uh, Jennifer Garner, the actress, does where they did readings online. And so we would participate in those. And then I just thought to myself, oh, how cool would it be, like, you know, if my book were to come out, since, you know, my, my philosophy aligns with their philosophy, uh, to just reach out and ask them, hey, could I be a part of that? Or how can we partner together? Yeah. Story App Live, like it started in a uh, Syrian refugee um, uh, in Lebanon. And um, I'm of Lebanese descent. And so for me, that I, that was my heart right there. And the guy mm -hmm. who runs it, his name is Mike. And he was just so cool and great with the kids. And I just said to him, you know, hey, I want to talk to you because I wanted to know like, hey, would it be okay for me to read to kids in some of the, you know, um, countries like Haiti or Lebanon, because, you know, that's where my family's from, uh, to talk about this or India, right? And uh, one thing led to another conversation led to another. And then that's how I ended up having these conversations with people I don't even know, but because we shared something in common, it made something possible. Sure. And it was the same thing with pajama program. Because they were like, we would love to have you read bedtime stories to the kids or talk about a bedtime routine that's, you know, maybe different from what they're accustomed to, because these are kids in foster homes, these are kids who, um, you know, don't have someone to read to them, they're kids in refugee camps. And then it made me realize, when I sat in this office and wrote Goodnight Ganesha, I wrote it for a singular person. I wrote it for my child who was like, mom, you need to write this story. And then... I wrote the story, but again, it was still singular until it goes through the machine, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the publisher, the marketing team. And then you start to realize as they're promoting and market and helping you market your book, that your book is, once it leaves your hands, once it goes to the illustrator and it goes into the world, expect your book to be something completely different than you expected. Because yeah. when you're sitting here in your office and you're writing your story and you're you know, chuckling to yourself when it becomes a real book and you see the responses that you're getting. I mean, I cry sometimes just looking at people tweeting pictures of the book or like showing me their shelfies that I've been doing with them, which is like, that's why I said, hey, Gigi in the wild, if you have my book, I want to <laughs> see how it impacts your life. Like tell yeah. me how it makes you feel. And I mean, I'm not doing it for marketing purposes. I'm just doing it because I was like, Oh, people really like it. Hey, let's see where Gigi's in the wild. Like Absolutely. if you're traveling, you see it on a shelf, shoot me a picture and I will post it. Well, and I think you you're so, you're so right in that, you know, your book, when you're writing it, it's singular, it's yours. And then when it goes out in the world, it becomes bigger than that. Right. And to see the response helps you let go a little bit, because as the author, you have to let go. You can't, it's not just your book once you get that contract it also belongs to the illustrator the editor the art director they're all invested in it your agent it, it everybody's got investment in this to make it great and and ideally and i think in your case for sure it becomes better than you could have ever imagined on your right. own right but you have to be able to let go for that to happen and so yeah. seeing the result of that with people sending you pictures and and how it what it means to them must be so gratifying and so amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, the first time I actually saw Goodnight Ganesha, like literally in the wild, like I shared the video with everyone, um, you know, it, it, it was just like uh, overwhelming and I was overjoyed and I just couldn't believe it because it was like, oh my God, uh, this is, this is something that I worked, you know, almost four years for, and here it is in a box. I'm holding like my own words that I wrote in my hands and my kid finally gets to see themselves you know when I did my official mm -hmm. unboxing and then when Barnes and Noble called me and they were like hey your book's on the shelves come on down and I was like seriously you guys put my books out like they're on the shelf like we literally like got off the phone hopped in the truck went straight to Barnes and Noble and then when we walked in it was like I, I was just like I, I could not believe it and then there was a gentleman who happened to be standing by my book and this is why I tell you like I don't know about this book about like the karma the cosmic universe or whatever with this book but the gentleman who was standing at the counter had his back to the book and then my mother-in-law my husband and I and our child we were standing there and we were all like oh my god and I was like yeah like just I just couldn't contain my excitement and he turns around and he looks and he goes good evening and we're like yeah good evening and then he's like what's all the excitement about and I'm like you're standing next to my book <laughs> and he's like you wrote this and I was like yes and then he goes can I take a look at it I'm like of course it's a lot it's a you know it's a book store. please <laughs> you know feel free to check it out so then he moves to the side and then like we take pictures with the book and as we were about to leave his brother comes up and he goes, Hey, what you got there? And he's like, she wrote this book. And then he, he, he was like, I want to buy it. And I was like, really? And he was like, yes. And I'm like, you don't have to buy it just because I'm, you know, I'm standing here. <laughs> but this is, this is how like, you know, imposter syndrome starts sinking in. Right. And like I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, but he was willing to buy my book. And then I was about to walk away and his brother goes, Oh wait, but aren't, aren't you going to sign it? And I was like, Oh you want me to sign it? it was just like, <laughs> I was totally like, I don't know. Not oh, there. wonderful. But then oh. I signed it. And then they were like, what part of, you know, Hyderabad are you from? And we were like, you're from Hyderabad? And they're like, yeah, we're from Hyderabad. Can you imagine? Wow. From the same city. Wow. In Southern That's Indian. amazing. And so That's I was just like, this, like, I couldn't have written a better, like, full circle for this. Than Absolutely. That. So that was like my first official signing to the Mirza family. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you when you put your books out there and for the first time you see it out in the wild, it's such an incredible feeling. I can't even explain it. It's just, it felt like a great sense of accomplishment for me because even though I've had all these different um, lifetime experiences, different career paths, um, none have been as fulfilling for me. Mm -hmm. as my writing mm -hmm. as my authorship this this is the first time I felt like when I sat down one day after um you know the cover reveal like I felt like oh my god I accomplished something greater than myself mm -hmm. I accomplished something that will impact people in ways that I never imagined starting not only for my child but now for all the responses that people say to me mm -hmm. that this book touched my family or, oh my God, it's great that we can see ourselves, you know, reflected or wow, someone got it right. When you get it right and people tell you that, just consider that such a gift because so many times we don't get it right. And, you know, for someone to say to me that um, this is influencing them, this is impacting them, or it's made some kind of, um, you know, emotional resonation with them, Mm -hmm. that's all that I need to know that like yeah. you know what I don't care how you know if this book ever sells again but the fact that it touched someone's life is mm -hmm. what I'm still you know um I don't know it's just surreal <laughs> well and I I imagine you will have this experience many more times because <laughs> I think we're going to be talking about a lot of your books in the future for sure Aww. yes well i want to get to these questions really yeah. quickly we've kept you so long and it's been yeah, amazing yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. thank you um but uh real quick these are about uh basically uh, querying and that kind of thing yeah. so real fast when you send your query letter to agents do you address them by their first name 
how, how formal are you in your queries? Um, I grew up formal, so I tend to be formal. Mm -hmm. And the only ones that I refer to them by their first name maybe is, you know, if they tell me that's how they would like me to refer mm -hmm. to them as like if I've met them like you know Melissa Manlove for example I've met her I I you know like we know each other um she's been at different events so like if I were to refer to her then I would say mm -hmm. you know Melissa right but I usually still prefer to say dear Ms. Manlove because it's in a professional setting okay. and then of course you have people who tell you hey I'm I'm younger than you or I'm younger than your parents just refer to me by my first name so I think it's important to you know, um, mm -hmm. sure. To, to just, you know, it, it's okay to ask as well. Or if you don't know the person, I just say, just use respectful language. Absolutely. Because this is a business letter that you are sending. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think you can ever err on the side of being too professional. Correct. So I, I completely agree with that. So if the query criteria asks for comp titles and they want comp titles that are similar to your book and those that are dissimilar mm -hmm. uh, and it creates a longer query letter do you think it's okay to run over two pages or would you always nope. try to edit nope. it down nope one page doesn't matter you you don't need more than two titles and also mm -hmm. make sure that your titles are current they're within the you know uh the la you know the last five years you know, mm -hmm. from whatever date that you're working on the last five years, unless you want to refer to a title that's much older, because it is still relevant. Mm -hmm. Correct. But, but don't don't, you know, pick like a completely obscure random, like only you would know or somebody yeah. else would know, like you want a book that's universal and relatable. Because remember, everything that you're doing when you're writing has to be relatable. And it goes back to your query letter. And mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, what you put in your query letter sometimes that ends up being some of the copy that your editor or that agent will use to sell your book or publish your book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so, that's true that's so true be, be be you know think about that when you're writing your query letter like yeah. what you want to put in there because if you create a query letter that's um you know, good enough for an editor to be like, oh, I could use this, I could use that. Like that gives them more reason to even look at your work. So your query letter is really doing more than just, hey, introducing you and telling them that you want to query them. It's also an opportunity for them to look at your writing and how they can, like all of that gets pulled and used in your marketing. Mm -hmm. And when they pitch the manuscript to the acquisitions, they take right. it to the acquisitions meeting, they have to pitch your manuscript to the marketing department, the sales, the, the financial, they're going to say, can we afford to publish this book? How much is this mm -hmm. going to cost us? So you're right. The What you put in your query letter, if it's really strong, if it's a really great pitch and really great hook, they can use that over and over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's important. X. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question. I'm just working on building my website. Can you give me some guidance on writing my first blog? I am an unpublished author. So do you have a blog on top of everything else you're doing? No, no, I, I opted not to do a blog because um, I'm, I, I'm a journalist by trade. So for me, I'm like, no, I don't want to do a blog. It's just it's too much work. Um, I have a family. I have, um, you know, a lot that I manage. And I, I was like, I stop at blog. Like if you see me online, I'm, I'm mostly on socials, whether it's, um, you know, Instagram, Facebook is not really like my favorite place. Like that's always my last resort place that I go to, but Twitter and Instagram are the two places that, um, I, I felt, uh, that's, that's where I'm comfortable. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I signed up for TikTok, but like, I'm not quite there yet for it, yeah. but, um, <laughs> you know, for a blog, you have to be committed to write a blog. Mm -hmm. And even though I know I could write a blog, I know I, I could put one together, but mm -hmm. it is time consuming. And it's like, you have to come up with story ideas as well to write, um, you know, uh, a, a post and you have to keep your content fresh, relevant, yes. right? And so at this point, even though I know I have a lot to say, but I just don't feel like um, it would be um, in my best interest or, uh, you know, to serve you mm -hmm. to write a blog if sure. I'm not going to be committed to it. Right. It takes now, 
That's true. Now I know some writers who are not published and they have wonderful blogs and I think it's wonderful because it's creating a presence for them and, and they have a right. lot of followers and usually it's, they're blogging about something that interests them that yeah. will eventually be connected to what they're writing. Right. Um, so it might be a nonfiction, you know, science related blog. It might be a blog on, you know, uh, parenting and, and, and getting kids interested in reading, whatever it is. So I think for me, for my advice would be find something you are passionate about that you are going to want to write about on a regular basis. Right. That will connect to other people who are passionate about the same thing, and they will eventually become your customers for your book. Right. And so you don't have to blog about your book or what you're working on. It's more of a general interest. Here's who I am. And you're connecting right. with other people who have those same interests. Right. I like, you know, my advice to you is um, I just write about like, you know, something that appeals to me or mm -hmm. um, like having to promote my book is very uncomfortable for me right now uh, because, uh, you know, usually I post about just like, you know, silly things right or I, I like my friend's book and I'll be like hey like for example Mira's book came out today right so uh which is this book uh between two worlds mm -hmm. it, it's between two worlds and it came out today and like I usually do like these happy birthday videos for friends or like you know people that I really love their book or I, I want to support them and her book today like I, I I had been waiting for this book to come you know in the mail and it didn't arrive till you know uh, this afternoon when I went to pick up my kid at school and when I came back I was like okay well I'm just going to do a totally random one so I did the happy birthday video but I just like you know showed the book and everything and you know flipped a page to to share that because I want to support you know my friends I want to support other writers authors that you know have books coming out AJ Irving like she just announced like one of her book deals about this book that I know she talked about when she was doing her virtual book launch with um, her her first book about um, dancing like a leaf, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I don't know. I I feel like any relationship that I've developed with anyone online, I consider it a genuine relationship because we can't meet in person. But I feel that I've gotten to know so many people mm -hmm. more virtually than I did when. I was in person. And that's why when I did the live social, like I had almost a hundred people there. And my husband was like, how do you know all these people? I'm like, oh, we, you know, they're my IG or my like, you know, face, yeah. Facebook or Twitter friends, or, you know, my writer friends, the writing community, you know, if you see someone's post and they're talking to you about how they're having a bad day, you know what? Acknowledge it because mm -hmm. we have all been there. Sure. And it's like important to say, Hey, I hear you. I see you. I don't know you, but like, I know what you're going through. And when someone tweets something so personal to me, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge it. Like if someone writes on Twitter or IG that their, you know, sibling or their parent or something bad happened in their lives, I'm a very private person, even though like I, I'm, I'm public at the same time. Mm -hmm. But if I were to post that like my dad died and no one responded to that, that would hurt so deeply. Sure. So if someone posts something that um, you see it, respond. You don't have mm -hmm. to say anything major because maybe they're just putting it out there because they just want someone to acknowledge whatever it is they're experiencing. So I yeah. feel like in the writing community, if someone says, I'm having a bad day, what do I do to, to feel better? Offer advice, right? Yeah. Guaranteed yeah. that person will remember you and they will help you like you know, when you are having a bad day and they'll be like, you know what? I remember that writer. I don't know them from Adam, but like they reached out to me. Like these people, I may not be able to recognize them in person. Yeah. But you tell me your yeah. social handle and I'll be like, oh, I remember you. Like I remember people. By sure. Yep. Handle. Well, again, it's just, it gets back to putting a little bit of yourself out there right. each time and people respond to that. That yeah, is so true. Human. Like, yep. you know, just treat others how you would like to be treated and I, I promise you, like, it just comes right back. Like, why do we like the actors that we like? Why do we like the performers that we like? Why do we like, you know, certain people more than others? It's because the people that, like, you know, you have an affinity towards are usually the people who are most willing, like you're saying, Laura, 
mm-hmm. deal with themselves. Right. You know, what yeah. does it hurt? Yeah, exactly. Well, last question here, and we're going to let you all go. Uh, Gabby says you had 21 manuscripts when trying to get an agent. How important is it that the manuscripts you have all have similar themes or tone so as to present a consistent brand? Or did you even worry about that? No, no. don't don't worry about that. Don't fret about that, because the point is write the story you're meant to write. Yep, that's so true. don't, Don't write to trends. Don't write to, oh, this is selling right now. Write the story that you feel in your heart. Mm-hmm. Write the story where the character whispers in your ear. Write the story that comes to your mind when you least expect, you know, a story to be written. Because um, that's how ideas, you know, come to be. Uh, write the story just for the sheer love of writing a story. I I wouldn't write a story because you want to copy something else or mimic something else, even though in a funny way, like that's how Good Night Ganesha started. But it became my own because I put my family in that story Mm -hmm. i put something important in that story Mm -hmm. bedtime is universal we can never run out of bedtime stories just like we can never run out of you know barnyard stories or animal stories or you know what i mean there's always an angle and the more genuine that your angle is that is your story so i wouldn't worry about oh it has to fall under because do you want to pigeonhole yourself or do you want to be you know a broad um writer author you don't want to sit there and write only this story because then you're pigeonholing yourself. Then it says, this is all that you know how to do. Right. And then no one will even give you a chance for something else because your laser focused on building this. Mm-hmm. I view it as what are the themes that you often find in your stories that you're writing about? Mine are usually about family, different experiences, loss, and just trying to turn a negative experience into a positive Mm -hmm. or I just have really crazy ideas and I put them down on paper I give them to Joan and she's like oh that is like one crazy story and (laughs) you know what I mean and so it's just kind of like just be true to who you are Mm -hmm. and you can't go wrong with that don't don't box yourself in like you want to open you know um because you never know which one's going to hit you weren't even pitching good night Ganesha And yeah. look at what happened. And look right. at what happened. And I mean, I, I I still have like three other manuscripts that are out on sub right now that were out on sub with uh, Goodnight Ganesha. One of them is a niche story. It's about alcoholism, you know, tough subject matter. I get it. Um, and another one was like a, a retelling of like a fairy tale. And then of course, My Colorful World and then Goodnight Ganesha, mm-hmm. right? They were all out at the same time. And the book that I thought would sell first <laughs> you, never know. Matter, so you never there's know there's no way to predict publishing <laughs> i've learned yeah. that in 31 years <laughs> yeah. so yeah well this has been amazing and i thank you we had a lot of people hanging out to the end which is great awesome. and they couldn't turn you off they just were so <laughs> riveted <laughs> and i so appreciate all your time yeah. and it was so inspirational I think everybody is just coming away from this feeling really good about just writing and life and people and it's all good. (laughs) And and I'm always online. Like, you know, don't feel that I'm not approachable. Like, I mean, today, for example, okay, this is, this is, this is, if this is not the epitome of like what our community is like, I don't even know what to say. I, today I was in a write-in with another author who writes middle grade and I'm working on a graphic novel and I asked a question and, um, you know, the author was like, I'm not sure about that. And I was like, you know what, do you think if I throw it out on Twitter and ask like, you know, these people, will they answer? And uh, the author was like, go for it. And I literally like, I threw out a question about, um, do I need like a character Bible for, um, you know, my, my characters, even though I'm just like an, like a text author for the graphic Mm -hmm. novel, Mm because at the moment I don't illustrate. So I reached out to Jerry Kraft, Drew Brockington, Dan Santat. And I was like, okay, these are people I've interacted with before online. So they're not total strangers to me, but you know what? Because I've had, you know, um, communication back and forth with them within minutes, I had a response to my question. So Mm -hmm. 
don't think because oh that you know that's a big name author yeah. or whatever that they won't respond to you if you're genuine in what you're asking they will respond to you and likewise like if someone's genuine in their response or you know asking me a question i'm more than happy to help you if i'm able to help you and if i don't know i can say i don't know but i'll reach out to someone and and kind of tag them and get you in touch with each other to help mm -hmm. each other out because that's what we do yeah. So I don't know. That's that's kind of my vision for for this community. That's always what it's been for me um, since being in it. So I say to you, have audacity, go out there and just put yourself out there. Just do it because you never know what will come back. That's where we're going to end. I can't I can't top that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank right. you so much, Nadia. You're very Love welcome. You. And we I expect you guys too. Oh my to God. hear about your next book when it comes out. So yes. we'll celebrate that yes. for sure. Yes. Okay. And I don't know which one's going to come out first, but if it's the second one, um, that one was my 15 plus uh, project. So that one, would, I definitely want to celebrate. <laughs> okay. We will. All right. All right. Well, Good you night, all everyone. have a great night, and we will see you all next time. Nadia, you have a great night. You too. Get some Thank rest. Yes, <laughs> I will. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you all. Thank Bye. You. Bye.